It's all comedy, hidden theory. We can laugh at what we need. Hey there, I'm Dina Ware, and welcome to It's All Comedy in Theory, a special report. Our regular host, Charlie Spink, is taking a little break. Don't worry, through the magic of editing, you'll still be graced with the dulcet tones of Charlie's voice throughout this video. In this episode, we explore the three-decade-long career of Burt Williams, one of the preeminent entertainers of the vaudeville era, one of the most popular comedians for all audiences of his time, and the first black American to take a lead role on the Broadway stage. The man with the real sense of humor is the man who can put himself in the spectator's place and laugh at his own misfortune. Burt Williams was born in the Bahamas on November 12, 1874, to Frederick and Julia Williams. At the age of 11, Burt emigrated with his parents, ultimately to California, where he graduated from Riverside High School in 1892. As a teenager, he joined various West Coast minstrel shows, where he met his future professional partner, George Walker. Williams and Walker performed song and dance numbers, comic dialogues and skits, and humorous songs. The sharp-featured and slendered Walker developed a persona as a strutting dandy, while the stocky Williams played the languorous oaf. Despite his thick-set physique, Williams was a master of body language and physical stage business. A New York Times reviewer wrote, He holds a face for minutes at a time, seemingly, and when he alters it, brings a laugh by the least movement. During the late 1890s, Williams and Walker appeared in a succession of shows, and their popularity was growing rapidly, but they still faced vivid reminders of the limits placed on them by white society. In August 1900, in New York City, hysterical rumors of a white detective having been shot by a black man erupted into an uncontained riot. Unaware of the street violence, Williams and Walker left their theater after a performance and parted ways. Williams headed off in a fortunate direction, but Walker was yanked from a streetcar by a white mob and was beaten. Williams wrote, Sometimes people ask me if I would not give anything to be white. I answer, most emphatically no. In fact, I have never been able to discover that there was anything disgraceful in being a colored man, but I have often found it inconvenient in America. Despite racial tensions of the era, the duo continued a successful run of shows in the early 1900s in both the U.S. and the United Kingdom. Sons of Ham, In Dahomey, and Abyssinia were hits with show-going audiences. Williams recorded many of the songs from Abyssinia, one of the songs, Nobody, became his signature theme and the song he is best remembered for today. It is a doleful and ironic composition, replete with his dry observational wit and is perfectly complemented by William's intimate, half-spoken singing style. Williams became so identified with the song that he was obliged to sing it in almost every appearance for the rest of his life. He considered its success both a blessing and a curse. Before I got through with nobody, I could have wished that both the author of the words and the assembler of the tune had been strangled or drowned. By 1909, George Walker was in ill health. He suffered a stroke on stage, and the famous pair never performed in public again. Walker died less than two years later. After 16 years as half a duo, Williams needed to reestablish himself as a solo act. In May 1909, he returned to Hammerstein's Victoria Theatre and the high-class vaudeville circuit. His new act consisted of several songs, comic monologues, and a concluding dance. He received top billing and a high salary. Williams later accepted an unprecedented offer to join Florence Ziegfeld's Follies. The idea of a black feature performance amid an otherwise all-white show was a shock. Williams' initial reception by the cast was cool, and several members delivered an ultimatum to Ziegfeld that Williams be fired. Ziegfeld held firm, saying, I can replace every one of you, except for the man you want me to fire. Regardless of what the Follies cast thought, Williams was a sensation with the audience. In addition to his solo performances, he also had successful pairings with Eddie Cantor and Leon Errol. Comedian Eddie Cantor describes Williams as having extraordinary powers as a pantomimist, an incomparable way with the audience, manipulating their emotions as if they were puppets on strings, a moment of silence as they watched his gestures, his shuffle, his expressive face and hands. Then, thunderous applause. 
One of William's best received sketches featured Leon Errol as a tourist and Williams as a porter using a mountaineer's rope to lead him across dangerously high girders in the then unfinished Grand Central Station. Errol's fast-talking persona and frenetic physical comedy gave Williams an effective onstage foil. Williams and Errol wrote the sketch themselves, turning it into a 20-minute centerpiece of the show. The team of Williams and Errol was a groundbreaking pairing that had never been seen before on the Broadway stage, with Williams delivering most of the punchlines and generally getting the better of Errol. At the conclusion of their Grand Central Station routine, Errol offered Williams a mere five cent tip, to which the aggrieved Williams deliberately loosened Errol's supporting rope, sending him plunging from the high girder. Then a construction explosion below sent Errol shooting into the sky, unseen by the audience, while Williams laconically described his trajectory. There he goes. Now he's near the Metropolitan Tower. If he could only grab that little cold knob on top, oh, um, he muffed it. Williams continued as the featured star of the Follies, signing a three-year contract that paid him an annual salary of $62,400 a year, equivalent to about $1.5 million today. Williams did not appear in the Ziegfeld Follies of 1913, instead taking part in an all-black review of The Frogs, a theatrical organization that had been founded in 1908 by George Walker. For many of his black fans, this was the first time to see Williams on stage since before he joined the Follies. Following the Frogs tour, Williams set out again on the vaudeville circuit where he was the highest paid black performer for his time. Williams' stage career lagged after his final Follies appearance in 1919. On February 27, 1922, Williams collapsed during a performance in Detroit, which the audience initially thought was a comic bit. Helped to his dressing room, Williams quipped, that's a nice way to die. They was laughing when I made my last exit. He died at his home on March 4, 1922, at the age of 47. Few had suspected that he was sick, and news of his death came as a public shock. More than 5,000 fans filed past his casket, and thousands more were turned away. A private service was held at the Masonic Lodge in Manhattan, where Williams broke his last barrier. He was the first black American to be so honored by the all-white Grand Lodge. Burt Williams, through his stage persona, comedy and music, had an indelible impact on entertainment history. His work has touched and influenced entertainers throughout decades, during and after his accomplished life. Fellow vaudevillian W.C. Fields, who appeared in several productions with Williams, described him as the funniest man I ever saw and the saddest man I ever knew. In 1910, Booker T. Washington wrote of Williams, He has done more for our race than I have. He smiled his way into people's hearts. I have been obliged to fight my way. Gene Buck, who had discovered W.C. Fields in vaudeville and hired him for the Follies, wrote to a friend on the occasion of Fields' death. Next to Burt Williams, Bill Fields was the greatest comic that ever lived. In 1940, Duke Ellington composed and recorded the tribute, A Portrait of Burt Williams. In 1978, in a memorable turn on a Boston Pops TV special, Ben Vereen performed a tribute to Williams with his high-kick dance steps to classic vaudeville standards. In World War II, the United States Liberty ship SS Burt Williams was named in his honor. In 1996, Burt Williams was inducted into the International Clown Hall of Fame. Dancing in the Dark by Carol Phillips is a 2005 novelization of the life of Burt Williams. Nobody by Richard Allen is a 2008 play centered around Burt Williams and George Walker's time in vaudeville. I never do love on a body, no time. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to check our other videos and hit that subscribe button to get more It's All Comedy and Theory. I'm Dina Ware and not Charlie Spink. It's all jokes, it's all good It's all jokes, it's all good Comedy, baby! Ha! <laughs>